scripture reading this morning is found in James chapter 5. James chapter 5, my text is verses 7 through 11, uh, but I will read from verse 1 to pick up the context. James chapter 5. Go to now, ye rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver is cankered. The rest of them shall be a witness against you, and, ye shall, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, cry it. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. And he wrote a process. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and have been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in the day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just. And he doth not resist you. And now my text. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husband that waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. As I have said before in the introduction to this book, James wrote this epistle to a church that was scattered, poor, outcast, and persecuted. He begins at the very beginning by saying, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh, worketh patience, but let patience have her perfect work, that she may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. It seems odd that James would tell us to rejoice in our tribulations. When we are undergoing tribulations, when we are suffering, whatever they are, whatever those sufferings might be, our role is to make them end as quickly as possible. God's role is for us to enter into communion with Him. So he says to rejoice in all of them, no matter how diverse they are, for God is using them to draw us to Himself, whether we struggle with chronic illness or anxiety or poverty or persecution or with other afflictions. There are as many different kinds of tribulations as there are temptations where the devil does not cease. So no matter what these tribulations are, the apostle says rejoice. This makes no sense unless you understand the chief end of man. Why do we made? What are we here for? Why did God create us and breathe into our nostrils the breath of life? The answer is we were made for communion. To live with God in eternal blessedness, to praise and glorify Him. That's the end of mankind, the finish line that everything else points to. It's what we were made for. It's what we long for. It's the pearl of great price, the hidden treasure that Jesus said the wise man sells everything you might attain it. And it's freely given. It's the inheritance that we receive in Jesus Christ. Those who receive him, the scripture says, are given the power to become the children of God and heirs of all things. And God said to Abraham, I am your reward. What a glorious inheritance we have. God himself. But the scripture also tells us you must be born again to even see the kingdom of God. That great treasure to live with God in eternal blessedness is restored to us in Christ. But too often in this world, we are governed by the flesh. We are blinded by the things of this world, and so we are impatient, untrusting, unsteady, and unloving. A few weeks ago, I preached on God 
calling to us out of the depths, and us calling upon God from the depths. This is the joy that the depths bring to us. We learn to call upon God. You know as well as I do that when we are in our highs, when everyone is speaking well of us, when the future is secure, when our health is good, when our barns are full, we tend to pat our stomachs and say, oh, you have laid up for yourself treasure for many days. We all know that in those times, fellowship with God falls to the wayside. Our prayers become rote. We forget to pray. We forget to talk to God. We forget to long for the treasure that we were made for, and we are too much satisfied with the things of this earth. And thus, God allows us to enter the depths, because in the depths, we find what we were made for. Fellowship with God. We speak to him in prayer. He speaks to us through his word. In the depths, we find ourselves opening the Bibles and reading. In the depths, we open up our lips and cry, Abba, Father. In the depths, we hear his promise. In the depths, we hold to the cross. But if we don't let patience have her perfect work, tribulation leaves us angry, hardened, untrusting far from God. That's the point of this book. James is calling us back to fellowship, to lay aside the sin that so easily besets us, to lay aside the residue of wickedness, and come back to fellowship. He says in our text, do you see the end that the Lord has provided, Job? God has a far better harvest in mind than the one we far too often strive for or the one we settle for. God would give us himself, but our hands are too full of the trinkets and bottles of this world. When tribulation strikes, God would have us know him, to call upon him from the depths, for he has ordained a better resurrection for us who would be made perfect. And so in our text, James gives us three admonitions. I will repeat them frequently because in the dark night of the soul, as we are struggling in the depths, it's good to have something memorized to hold on to. So I will repeat them. Be patient. Be firm. Be charitable. Be patient. Be firm. Be charitable. First, be patient. God would have our affections and our desires and our treasure in heaven. They aren't home yet. He would not have us too much at home here, for we were made for another country, another kingdom, another king. We have appetites that cannot be satisfied with earthly food, and we have thirsts that cannot be quenched with any earthly water. We long for the day when Jesus comes again and this corruptible man puts on incorruption. When we walk on the new earth, under the new heavens that are forever with the Lord. And until that day, we groan within ourselves. We sigh. But the key is how we groan and how we sigh. Be patient. Everyone is waiting. Everyone is longing. Every one of God's children suffers tribulation. And we can either suffer impatiently to our own detriment, or we can learn patience. Psalm 131 describes it perfectly. Lord, my heart is not haughty or lifted up, nor mine eyes lofty. Neither do I exercise myself in great matters or in things too high for me. Surely I have behaved and quieted myself as a child that is weaned of his mother. My soul is even as a weaned child. Let Israel hope in the Lord from henceforth and forever. The impatient man demands to pry into the secret things of God. The impatient man is proud, demanding that his circumstances be changed. He views tribulation as God not keeping up his end of the bargain. It's patently unfair. So he never rests. He's like a baby demanding to be fed right now when God would have us grow to learn to sit, to say, my father's got this. I can rest and wait. So he says, behave. Quiet yourself. 
And you do that by hoping in the Lord. We hope in the Lord even when we groan within ourselves. We hope in the Lord even when we are suffering. We hope in the Lord even when circumstances are extremely difficult. I remind myself frequently that our good God and Father, willing and able to give us all things necessary for body and soul. And for this reason, I can know for certain God has a good purpose, even in tribulation. I don't know all the details, but I know what he has revealed to me, that in my sufferings I learn to stay close to my shepherd. That's the beginning of eternal life. It's springing into this age. We were made for communion with God, and in our suffering, when we grab a hold of God and say, Abba, Father, that's the beginning of eternal life. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that I might know you. Shepherd puts blinders on our eyes so that all of the distractions are shut away and our focus becomes singular. Father, save me. And we know a little bit more about God and the depths. And so we wait, knowing that he hears us, knowing that he answers us, knowing that he loves us and desires only that which is good for us. We look to the glorious future when Christ will come again. Be patient in hope. And through that patience, we find ourselves more and more drawn into fellowship with our Creator. Be patient. Be firm. I wanted you to remember it, so I put it in a, a memorable form, I hope, so that we might learn it correctly. But being firm does not mean be stubborn over your sinful patterns. It means establish your heart. Place your heart on solid, unmoving ground. So I'm using the word the way the scripture uses the word. In the scripture, your heart is the center of who you are as a person. Your heart is how you think, how you feel, what you love what you long for, what your desires are. In the heart, the fool says, there is no God. But in the heart, the believer cries out to the creator of the universe. To establish your heart means to get your heart, your inner being, who you are, set firmly on the only foundation there is, the promises of God in Jesus Christ. To understand this, I will remind you of a familiar example which I've used before. King Ahaz of Judah. You can read about him in Isaiah chapter 7. He was threatened by two godless kings. He was very afraid of them, and he was about to make an extremely foolish decision. He was about to enter into a treaty with the Assyrians. Isaiah was sent to remind him that all the nations of the earth are as drops in the bucket. That God would deliver him from these two wicked kings and warn him to not act foolishly and turn his back on God, but trust in God, trust in his word, and rest. And then he says, if you will not believe, surely you shall not be established. The same Hebrew word in that text is used for believe and established. The root of that word is to be set on a firm foundation. It's a house that's built on bedrock. It's a strong undercurrent of stone when you're walking through mire. It's unmoving feet when everything else is whirling around. God said to Ahaz, everything is whirling around you. But I promise you, these two kings that are threatening you will come to nothing. If you rest on that promise translated belief, you will be firm, translated establish. And that Hebrew word, translated believe or establish, is amen. Jesus said it throughout all of his teaching when he said, amen, amen, verily, verily, I say unto you. It means that God's promises in his word in Christ are sure. His truth is unchanging. No one can ever pluck us out of his hands. We are secure in Christ. His work is complete. 
perfect, finished. And the scripture tells us that our suffering is because we are in Christ. We're partakers of his anointing. We suffer because it's God's will to glorify us in Christ. And there's no way to glory apart from the cross. There's no way to resurrection apart from picking up our cross and following him. We follow him in the resurrection because we follow him in crucifixion. The coming of the Lord is near, James says. Don't forget that. It's right around the corner. It's sooner than we think. Do we live our lives established on the firm promise of the coming of the Lord? Or is it just a dream to us? Is it just a fantasy in our heads that we run through like our favorite movie? Or is it something that we can set our feet on in hope that at any moment the trumpet will sound and the voice of the archangel will cry out and Christ will come again? How do we know for certain that this veil of tears will break forth into green pastures? How do we know for certain that this dark valley, this endless night, will burst open in sunlight and all the gloom will be dispelled? How do I know that God is walking with me, that he loves me, that he will never leave me or forsake me, even when it feels like I'm all alone? I know because he has promised that he cannot lie. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, For all the promises of God are in him, are yea, are yes, and in him, amen, established, firm, unto the glory of God. Now he which established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God. Establish your heart. Set it firmly on the promises that he has given us in Christ. Be firm. Be patient. Be firm. Be charitable. When the heart is not firm on the only foundation, when impatience reigns, it always overflows into the mouth. So he says, grudge not against one another. The word grudge means to groan. It's the same word used in Romans 8 that I used earlier in the sermon, that we groan within ourselves. The holy groaning is the response of a godly man living under a cursed world. But here there's a preposition attached. The preposition is against. The impatient man groans against his brothers and sisters. We groan, but we turn the groan into a weapon that we use to attack each other. And that's always a sign that our heart is not established. Too often when a brother or sister is encountering trials, we act like Job's counselors. We'll say, here's all the reasons why things are difficult right now and what you need to do to fix them. You sinned. You made bad decisions. That's why you're suffering. Good people who make all the right decisions don't suffer. That's absolutely deadly to the soul and deadly to fellowship. We're called to remember that Job's friends were condemned by God. It was Job that made intercession for them and offered sacrifices for them. The fact is, Scripture teaches throughout that the righteous suffer because they are righteous. We suffer because we belong to Christ. We suffer because it is through much tribulation that we enter into the kingdom of heaven. But the church in James's time, instead of bearing one another's burdens, they grumbled and complained against each other, heaping burden upon burden to those who were already suffering. The great example of that wicked murmuring that used throughout Scripture is found in Exodus as Israel is traveling through the wilderness. Their hearts were not established before the Lord. They did not trust in him, and therefore they were not patient. But they were petulant and demanding. And when times got tough and their stomachs started to rumble, they turned on Moses and Aaron and each other. The end result of their grumbling was their judgment. Paul reminds us of this in 1 Corinthians 10 when he says, Neither murmur ye. As some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. 
Now these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. This is what James reminds us of. Grudge not against one another, lest you be condemned. It's that serious. It puts us in a frame of mind that is contrary to the blessed fellowship of God. In our sufferings and in our trials, we are to turn to the Lord and call unto him and understand that blessed, wonderful communion with God, even in the midst of suffering. But we grumble against one another, turning our back on that fellowship, because you can't do both, as Israel found out in the wilderness. God called them to repentance over and over and over again, but they refused. God was patient for 40 years, but they refused. And finally, it was so entrenched it was too late, and their carcasses fell in the wilderness. Be charitable with one another. Love one another, for love is patient and love is kind. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Impatience is the fuel for grumbling and complaining against one another, and so put it off, for the judge is at the door. Be patient. Be firm, be charitable. In the long, dark night of the soul, those are the three pillars we can hold on to. Wait it out. Joy comes in the morning. Hold to the promises. Reach out of yourself. John Calvin's phrase for sin is being curved in on oneself. We far too often do that. We curve in on ourselves. James is reminding us to reach out of ourselves. Now he gives us two encouragements, two motives. First, the example of the husbandman or the farmer. And the second is the example of the prophets. In the long rainy seasons, when the hot sun is coming down and the seed is dying in the ground, we learn that all of that's necessary for the harvest. Paul says unless the seed falls into the ground and dies, it will never bring forth a harvest. God is the owner of the vineyard, and for that end, he desires our fruit. That is, he desires us to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, to praise and glorify him in eternal blessedness. And he knows exactly what we need to draw us into that fellowship with him. Even when he allows Satan to attack us, he's working. He's right there, tending the seed. The musician Andrew Peterson has a song called The Rain Keeps Falling. In that song, he's talking about those nights of anxiety and depression that wear on his soul, and he describes it as rain falling over and over again and crying out to Jesus, where's the sunlight, where's the light? And then at the end, he remembers that the seed grows when it rains. God desires fruit. He sends the early and the latter rains. He sends the hot sun because he desires fruit. The question is, do you desire that fruit? Is it your heart's desire to enter into that relationship with God above all else? Or do you just want the rain to stop? Rejoice in the rainy seasons. Rejoice in tribulations. Rejoice in the hot sun. Be patient. Be firm. Be charitable. And the second example, those who have gone before. Book of Hebrews, chapter 12, we hear the same thing. The writer says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, the sin which doth so easily beset us. Let us run with patience. The race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We were reminded in chapter 11 of Hebrews that every one of the prophets was persecuted, despised, outcast, and longed for a better kingdom. They held to the promises to the end. Peter said they greatly desired to look into the things that are revealed to us right now. 
God gave them tremendous privileges. They spoke the very words of God, but with that close fellowship came much persecution and tribulation. God drew them out of the fire. God drew them into the fire and then drew them out of the fire. And then they were fit vessels for his glory. When we suffer, we're often tempted to think we're the only ones. No one else has ever gone through this. There must be something wrong with me. Why do other Christians have it so good and everything always seems to go wrong for me? Because we tend to be curved in on ourselves. The apostle is lifting up our eyes. Consider the prophets. You're not alone. This is no different than what every Christian has suffered. We don't travel alone. The tribulation that we endure and will adore, the affliction of the soul, the affliction of the body, these things are common to God's people. In John chapter 15, Jesus says to his apostles, these things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world will love its own. But because you are not of this world, that I have chosen you out of the world, Therefore, the world hateth you. To be chosen out of the world is to be loved by God. He is our Father. He is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Those Greek words go together to mean God's mercy and compassion so far exceed anything we can imagine. For they are infinite. He cares. He sees our distress. In fact, in Christ, God became flesh. And he felt every emotion we 